All right, so we just talked about those five elements of self-defense, and all of these are cumulative, so they're all required. So um, the prosecution does not, if you're claiming self-defense, the prosecution does not have to disprove your claim of self in its entirety. The prosecution needs merely disprove any one, any one, and here's, we're in New York, so it's all five of these elements. The prosecution need disprove only any one of the required elements of self-defense, because if any one required element is missing, has been disproven by the prosecution, then you don't have self-defense. You can't have self-defense as a strictly technical legal matter because you're missing a required element. And if you're missing a required element, self-defense, it cannot be because these elements define what is, what qualifies as lawful self-defense. So when a prosecutor is looking at this kind of video, at the evidence in this kind of case, what he's looking for is do, do any one of these elements appear to be vulnerable to disproof beyond a reasonable doubt? You can think of these elements from a prosecutor's perspective. These elements are targets of attack on a claim of self-defense. He knows what he has to do if it's going to be a self-defense case. And he knows whether it's going to be a self-defense case because you're raising the legal de defense of self-defense. He knows if it's a self-defense case, his mission is to disprove any one of those required elements beyond a reasonable doubt. And if he does that, you have a serious problem. Because self-defense is known as a, uh, a legal defense, a defense of confession and avoidance. So it's different than, say, an alibi defense, right? An alibi defense is when you're saying, hey, it wasn't me. I don't know who did this. I was someplace else. I was at my mother's house having dinner that night. And she can attest to that. So when you're claiming an alibi defense, you're saying it, it wasn't you who did whatever the use of force was. When you're claiming self-defense, you're doing the opposite of that. You're not saying it wasn't you. You're saying it was me. It was me. I shot that guy. I killed him with that shot. But I did it with the legal justification of self-defense. So you're confessing not to a crime, but you're confessing to the underlying conduct, the shooting, the use of force, whatever it might be. But you're seeking to avoid legal liability for what would otherwise be a crime on the grounds that it was justified self-defense, confession and avoidance. I shot him in lawful self-defense. Well, the prosecution can disprove any one required element to self-defense. Self-defense disappears as a legal matter. And if self-defense disappears, the avoidance part of confession and avoidance also disappears. And if the av avoidance part of confession and avoidance disappears, the only thing left of confession and avoidance is confession. So not only does the prosecutor know that these are his targets of attack, and he need to disprove only one of them, but if he does disprove only one of them, it's a walk-away conviction because you've effectively then confessed to the criminal conduct with which you're charged. So that's arguably a, a benefit for the prosecution and of course a vulnerability for the defense in a self-defense case. So let's take a look at the video. <clears throat> Where does it start? It starts here. Jason Pass has gone upstairs to, I guess, scold his neighbors about excessive noise coming from their apartment above his. Is this being Jason Pass being the initial aggressor that would lose him the element of innocence and therefore lose him self-defense? No, you're allowed to talk at people. The, the initial aggressor is the person who first uses or threatens to use physical force. Talking is not physical force. Mere words alone cannot justify someone else's use of force in self-defense. So they're just talking to each other. Of course, we don't know what they're saying. I mean, if, if, you're, if, you're, if your words are threatening words, um, that's still not enough to make you the initial aggressor by itself, uh, absent some physical conduct uh, that would suggest to a reasonable person that you intend to carry through with that threat in an imminent way. And we'll come back to imminence in a moment. So very dangerous to rely on someone else's words alone to justify your own use of defensive force. Words could qualify someone as a provoker with intent. A provoker with intent is a particular 
flavor of initial aggressor. Um, it's a person who themselves is actually not the initial aggressor. They're not the first person to threaten or use force. They're trying to induce the other guy to be the initial aggressor. Uh, but with the intent of then having an excuse to use force on them. So this is the go ahead, throw the first punch, throw the first punch, I dare you scenario. Uh, the provoker with intent also loses innocence because they're they're trying to basically game the system. They're trying to falsely create something that would look like a justified use of force by them. Um, so, but we can't hear what's being said. Certainly by conduct, Jason Pass appears to be, I mean, reasonably calm here. He's not... A, already displaying a weapon. He's not getting into anybody's personal space. In fact, it's the victim that gets into Jason, Jason Pass's personal space. Jason Pass is about as far away from the victim's apartment door as you could get and still be on the same floor and be having a conversation. So let's roll here. <clears throat> I think here Jason Pass is fine. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Feels like he's uh, maybe he's manipulating his pistol under. It's kind of hard to tell. Excuse me. That one cough means I'm not going to jujitsu today. Ugh, I'm so frustrated. But I promised I wouldn't go to jujitsu if I was uh, still coughing. No sense making the whole dojo sick. All right, so here's the relevant part. So, so far, there's been really nothing but talking going on. But now we have the uh, victim coming out in his white T-shirt with scissors in his hand, closing very aggressively into Jason Pass's space. Comes up. I'll deal with this right here. Now, if Jason Pass had pulled this pistol right here, and shot the victim. Would that look like lawful self-defense? I, th I think so. I mean, let's consider the elements. Innocence, who's the initial physical aggressor here? Well, it would appear to be the victim. Is the act of aggression in the past or speculatively in the future, or is it actually taking place? It's taking place, it's an Im imminent threat. Uh, what's the intensity of the threat? Well, a pair of scissors held to your face, is that, reasonably foreseeable to inflict death or serious bodily harm in an imminent sense could immediately happen. Uh, yeah. So we're talking a deadly force threat against which deadly defensive force would be appropriate. Um, what about the question of avoidance? Is Jason Pass required in this moment to attempt to retreat from this confrontation before he'd be privileged to use deadly force and self-defense? Well, even in New York State, even in the duty to retreat states, you're only required, that duty's only imposed if it's practically possible to achieve the duty. So if it's impossible to retreat with complete safety and you're not required to increase your jeopardy in an effort to re retreat, so you don't have to turn your back on a raised knife in an effort to retreat. Uh, so if it's not possible to retreat with complete safety, then the duty's not imposed. And then there is no duty to retreat before you can use deadly force and self-defense. In this moment, I would suggest that with the scissors at the face, uh, inches away, safe retreat's not possible. So the, the element of avoidance wouldn't be an applicable target for the prosecution here. <clears throat> and then we have the element of reasonableness. Uh, did Jason Pass subjectively believe let's pretend he used deadly force in this moment, uh, that he needed to use deadly force. Of course, he would say yes. And then the question becomes, well, would a reasonable and prudent person objectively have shared that belief? And I think the facts would support that. So I think if Jason Pass had made the decision right here to draw his pistol and shoot the victim, he'd be on very sound footing under New York use of force law, even in the context of having... Um, that element of avoidance, that generalized legal duty to retreat if safely possible. The problem for Jason Pass is this is not when he decides to pull his pistol and shoot. So things proceed a little bit. And the victim here is quite aggressive. I mean, he's in his personal space. He's threatening at the face. The face is the most you know, threatening part of a person's body, really, you can go after. 
<clears throat> the woman tries to intervene. This is not going well. It can only real up, oh, and here comes the gun. So <clears throat> the woman had pulled uh, the victim uh, a small distance away from Jason Pass. Jason Pass took a couple steps back, got his gun out. So he's not using it yet. He is displaying it. Would this be a lawful defensive display of a gun? I would suggest yes. I think this is a prudent display of a gun. Um, in fact, he's he's displaying the gun here without shooting it yet, I would argue, if I were defense counsel at this moment in the case, um, that he's actually doing the victim a favor because he's trying to avoid having to actually shoot the victim. He's created enough space to get the gun out. He's backed up a distance, arguably satisfying. Um, New York State's legal duty to retreat. Um, and now he's prepared to defend himself if the victim were to come at him with the scissors again. Now, a prosecutor would argue, well, now that he's got his gun out, now is it safely possible, especially given this bit of distance, for Jason Pass to attempt to withdraw from the fight without having to actually use deadly force, fire shots? The stairs are right there. And of course, once he's on the stairs, then the victim has to either get around the barrier of the uh, the the railing there, or get over the barrier of the railing. It's a more defensible position if you can get onto the stairs from someone with an edged weapon like the victim. Um, but is it completely safe, or could the victim still reach over with those scissors? That would be the factual argument for the jury to consider. Um, so the gun's held high here, one-handed. So now he's just he's just kind of showing off with the gun. No reason not to have two hands on the gun here. Two hands come up on the gun. Weird kind of grip, like he's got his thumb over the top of the slide. Uh, unless maybe he's turning on his laser. In any case, the victim here sees the gun, and what's the victim doing? The victim is out. The victim's walking away. <clears throat> now, I would argue that the victim here had up to this point been the initial physical aggressor in the confrontation. But, and therefore he had lost the element of innocence and the victim would have had no privilege of self-defense. But one way to regain the element of innocence and regain self-defense is to withdraw from the fight and communicate your withdrawal from the fight. If you do that, you can regain your element of innocence and regain self-defense, even if you had previously been the initial aggressor. Now, you're still on the hook for your initial aggression. I mean, arguably, the victim has committed the crime of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon on Jason Pass. You don't lose that legal liability because you withdraw and communicate. You're still on the hook for what you did, but you regain innocence and regain self-defense for purposes of moving forward. At which point, Jason Pass arguably becomes the new initial aggressor in a second fight here. Now, I've heard people on Twitter say, well, you know, the victim here, he's still within the tooler distance. He still has an edged weapon. You could still characterize him as an imminent deadly force threat. You could, but that's a pretty hard sell. You think a jury would buy that? I don't. I mean, if I'm doing my neat legal analysis, I would certainly bring up that just to make sure it's accounted for. But he's not shuffling backwards, still facing Jason Pass. This looks for all the world like he's decided he brought scissors to a gunfight and he, he doesn't want to do that. So he's withdrawing from the confrontation. And it's at this point that Jason Pass decides to light him up with the green laser and shoot him in the back, right there. Oh, there's the muzzle flash. I don't think you're gonna be able to sell to a jury that when this initial shot is fired, that the victim here is presenting as an imminent deadly force threat to Jason Pass. Just don't see it. Which makes Jason Pass the unlawful deadly force aggressor in this what I would characterize as a second confrontation. Now, this illustrates an important facet of that element of imminence. Remember, imminence asks whether the threat you're defending yourself against is 
either actually occurring or immediately about to occur, ability, opportunity, jeopardy, or which, which is what's required for your use of defensive force to be lawful, or is it a past threat or a future threat that may never happen? Because neither of those justifies your use of defensive force in the moment. And imminence is, can be thought of like a window that opens and closes. And initially, there is no imminent threat, and then the situation escalates and the threat becomes imminent. You have ability, opportunity, and jeopardy. So the window's opened, and then the window can close. Circumstances change again, and there is no longer imminence. And I think that's what we're seeing here. I think when we're at this point with the scissors up at the face, we have an imminent deadly force threat from the victim towards Jason Pass. The window's opened. The window of eminence is open. But when we get here, <clears throat> the window of eminence is closed, folks. Now, might you be able to find one juror out of a thousand who would buy your argument that because of the Tuller drill, this is still a deadly force threat by the victim? I mean, maybe. Would you want to risk going into a cage for the rest of your life on that argument, on these facts? Not me. And then, of course, from this first shot, everything just escalates out the wazoo. So he sh the victim shot, shot. The stepson comes by. <coughs> Looks like he's trying to flee. Might Jason Pass argue when he fires this shot into the stepson that uh, the stepson was charging at him? And so Jason Pass was defending himself against the attack of the stepson. Well, not at the first shot into the first victim was unjustified. And he's the unlawful deadly force aggressor. I mean, then it would be lawful for the stepson to charge at him in self-defense. In any case, it doesn't look much like the stepson's charging at him anyway. Regardless, he fires into the stepson. Looks like a couple of times, more flashes. Stepson obviously badly hit, a lot of blood on the shirt, and Jason Pass shoots him again right there. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, absent uh, the stepson being apparently in possession of a firearm, what, what degree of threat could the stepson be presenting here? Right there. That's just an execution, folks. That's not lawful self-defense. The stepson's not presenting any apparent degree of threat here. So Jason Pass essentially executes the stepson there. And then he decides to walk back up towards the initial victim. Looks like he fires a couple more times. It's kind of hard to tell with that audio, but certainly right there, there's a recoil, the body moves, another execution shot into the head of the victim. So whatever you might have thought about the first shot, all that Tuller drill nonsense in the context of these facts, that all ends with these two execution style shots. So absolutely cannot be justified as lawful self-defense under any circumstances, but things might have been different if Jason Pass had made different decisions or the facts had been different. Again, if he had pulled his pistol and fired here, I think he would have had a very robust claim of self-defense, but he doesn't do that. He makes, he doesn't make good decisions. He makes bad decisions, decisions fundamentally inconsistent with lawful self-defense. And frankly, here, here, he should have just been patient. If he'd just been patient, the victim was walking away. At this point, before that first shot is fired, can Jason pass now with complete safety, withdraw down those stairs rather than use deadly force in self-defense? I would suggest yes. In which case, New York's duty to retreat, that element of avoidance, is back in effect. So his violation of that alone would strip him of self-defense as a legal defense within the context of New York state law.